because okay i start again after the recording <laughs> yeah you start again all right uh, yeah, so basically I came back from my break and all the crystals were not good. So mu E crystals were completely gone. Uh, mu D crystals were had bubbles inside, um, suggesting them they were compromised. Uh, the, then, so the problem that happened was the room was at high temperature for four or five days because the temperature control system didn't work. So it was reported on a Thursday, but it was not solved until Monday. And that has basically um, done that all the experiments that I had done didn't work. So I did tested some of the crystals of diamond uh, over the weekend, but I didn't have enough um, diffraction from them, from the crystals that kind of survived. Um, anything that I tried for soaking in terms of mu D, the crystals that were around, <laughs> not looking great, but at least around, those crystals uh, did not diffract, um, and co crystals uh, were they also looked damaged, but they got I got some like poor diffraction at eight astrons. It's still not good enough for any of the work that we want to do, so I need to repeat these experiments in the next weeks, and the next data collection time is going to be in January. So I'm I'm aiming for the first week they open at Diamond because Diamond is um, will be closed in in a week and a half. Um, yeah, so that's going to be on the week of the 18th of January, 18th, 16th, they will be open. So I want to send the crystals before, the week before, so we get uh, the first days um, of data collection. So do you want to say what was lost and what you're going to repeat? So I, I need to do soaking, so I need to do APO crystals again. Uh, and all the new co-crystallization experiments that I had done for um, the heats that we got. Um, and I also tried co-crystals as well with the W compounds, sorry, Johan compounds. Uh, in this round, I will include the two other, uh, the additional compounds that Johan sent. Um, and, and I'll have uh, extra, um, extra crystals for that. But yeah, so it was all that. Yeah, that was that was that was sad. We have a, a really nice crystallography room that's very temperature controlled, but obviously not on this instance. So some central control system went and everything got lost. I think it goes to show how heat heat labile these Muir crystals are, doesn't it? Because the PBPs that Muir, we have. Okay. Yeah, the PBPs are well, I also got the data for the PBPs. I was just analyzing them now. Um, they don't they don't have the greatest resolution, but at least I could get to five Armstrong something four in some of them, 3.5, uh, so on. <laughs> uh, so um, yeah, I think it got more hot than we thought. Yeah, was there a so recorder over, that said the temperature? Uh, the room is at 17 degrees and it was I mean, is, there's a little tracker usually that shows what temperature it got to. No. We, no, no, it completely went. So <laughs> we can't no, we, track it. We, we, we um, yeah, so it was seen at 23, I think, on Saturday, which would have been okay for Mu D crystals, not for Mu E, but Mu D should have been fine. Uh, but I think over the weekend, because PEPs seem to be as well not super happy, um, maybe it just gone much harder, much higher. We also got other crystals for all the targets. Um, and yeah, the same. So with another specific target with a student, we usually used to have 1.8, 1.5 astro resolution, and the maximum we manage is 2.6. So yeah. So yeah. we're going to buy a separate standalone incubator to go inside that room uh, as a belts and braces option. But at least time. for these precious experiments, that you know, mm. it takes a while to set them up again. Mm. Yeah. Any other structural um, input at the moment? No. No, I think that was it. Great. Lovely. But have you got anything from your end, uh, structure-wise? Or... No, we haven't. Uh, we talked to Joe about um, priorities, and I, I'm, but we haven't done any actual work lately besides we did get all the structures deposited as, as I think John reported last time and mm. uh, and uh, those should be released by now too. But. 
Mm. Didn't you need more protein, I think? I think there was an issue with the protein preps, right? That's the, you needed more, I mean, or something like that. Yeah, well, I also think I'm not even sure what we should do. Um, so I don't know which proteins I need. <laughs> like, do you have a specific re request? Um, so I'm mainly doing Nikolai. Mm -hmm. So any any other system that might work, um, Pseudomonas, uh, if you have the protein, if not, Acetinobacter. Okay. Just follow that up with an email. Uh, yes. just to mm, yeah. Well, we yeah. need to if if we wanted us to try the same compounds so that we could <laughs> sort of reproduce what you're doing, but over here in in Pseudomonas, on the Pseudon factor. Yeah, it's for compounds, but we we might get we might have better ones uh, after Adrian's talk. Mm -hmm. So it might be worth starting with those. Okay. Yeah, so I anyway, I'll, I'll make a priority list and send it. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Cool. Um, oh, welcome, Adrian. Well done. Hi. Sorry, uh, mate. That's all right. Should we move on to the uh, assay presentation that you've got then? So we have an enamine uh, assay update. Yeah. Okay. I'll share my screen. Lovely. You said, which is always a fun thing to do. Right, you all see that? I think, I hope. Okay, so um, basically we're going to go through what we've been doing with um, Pseudomonas MD, um, the stop class A thereof, and how we've actually now rolled that out against the enemy library, and how <clears throat> actually we're dealing with the results that have come out of it. So, to remind you all, um, we've got um, an assay that basically detects um, phosphate as a function of um, the generation of uric acid via xanthine oxidase and PMP. That generates hydrogen peroxide. And essentially, we've used that as a continuous assay, but we've basically worked it into a stopped assay, uh, where essentially we have, I beg your pardon, um, a stopping reagent made by Thermo Fisher, which uh, basically um, stops fluorescence accumulation via the Amplex Red. Um, and we have basically worked that into a stop assay that, from a pseudomonas originosum OD, gives good linearity with respect to protein, um, decent uh, time dependent kinetics of fluorescence accumulation which gives us rough linearity up to about 20 minutes with a nice big window between where we get activity in the presence of deglutamate and not in its absence, and with reasonably attractive Z prime parameters. In other words, the statistic that allows you to distinguish between <clears throat> what is and isn't enzyme activity. So with that in hand, if I just go down to the fourth slide, so um, we've now have that in a 384 well format. And essentially, if I can just go to 304. Um, the way we go about business now is that we have in the first, um, beg your pardon, he said, in the first four columns, um, Basically, we have controls. So the enzyme plus DMSO um, uh, with water, uh, the enzyme plus DMSO plus deglutamate. The same in this in, in columns four and five, the same thing, but with our standard inhibitor ADPCP. And then the compounds um, basically are mixed together without um, the uh, deglutamate substrate along. Uh, wells A6 to A24, and in the bottom row, O6 to O24, and then quite literally, we just pipette down from each particular uh, submaster mix to generate a triplicate of water control and a triplicate of the activity in the presence of deglutamate. 
And what I'm going to talk about essentially is plate BO2, although we have done the other half of the enamine library as well. Um, but over the eight plates that cover uh, our, the half of the library I've done, we get an average Z prime of about 0.66 um, uh, calculated um, from lanes one and two. Uh, sorry, lanes two and three, is, as I have it here. Um, and we're, we're quite happy with that as an assay. And we do all this on a various scan flash plate reader. So in total, um, although this is <laughs> in some ways a little bit meaningless, but essentially it just demonstrates the point. We have over the 302 compounds in plate BO2, a range of degrees of inhibition going all the way up to about 100% on the right hand side. And um, if we triage everything and have a cutoff of 50%, uh, we have 26 compounds. Um, the red bar um, corresponds to inhibition by ADPCP, but those <clears throat> uh, 26 compounds, um, they are then subject to further analysis because they may well inhibit the coupling enzymes. So we've developed a stopped coupling enzyme assay, uh, whereby we basically take pure nucleoside phosphorylase, we give it 0.1 millimole of phosphate and allow it to generate fluorescence. Um, we use two regimes for screening the coupling enzymes, a low PMP regime where we actually are able to assay the activity of PMP, and a high PMP regime where the stopped assay runs with exactly the same concentration of PMP that we actually have in the MERDI stopped assays. Um, essentially, the results are that um, if we, if you look at the top, the bottom two graphs, bottom left is what we see when we carry out the more stringent um, PMP assay. So there are some seven compounds which give less than 30% inhibition in the coupling enzyme assay, but give significant inhibition in the MERDI assay. And those we, if you like, have in the bank. Um, if we do the less stringent variety, something like 19 compounds get through um, as uh, compounds of interest. And we basically then uh, are going to triage those with a further PMP assay based upon a different principle to ensure that we are looking at MERDI inhibition. But of the seven compounds we're absolutely certain about from plate BO2, um, and we'll post the structures on the website, but here they are. Um, we, have, we have to do IC50s on these things to see exactly what their potency is like. Um, and as regards plate BO1, um, using the more stringent screening of the coupling enzymes, um, we essentially have two compounds which we're taking further at the moment. Um, they are K2 and F7. Um, K2 is interesting because it gives very nice IC50 values, but they are independent of ATP concentration, which means it's not an ATP uh, dependent competitive inhibitor. Um, the F7, uh, we've just trialed that at a single ATP concentration, so we don't know yet exactly uh, what it is competing with. Um, and that really is the state of play at the moment. So it's a work in progress. Uh, we've got to basically finish the coupling enzyme screen, finish the IC50s, um, and then see where we go from there. Then that's it. Lovely. Thanks, Adrian. And so th those two compounds, the two that you were mentioning that Laura's going to put into her her, her crystal trials. Yeah, but right. um, like I say, we also have a variety of other interesting candidates as well. <clears throat> I, I think certainly that K2, which is not ATP competitive, sounds intriguing. Yeah, it does. Any questions from anybody? So just a quick question from uh, from me. Sorry, I'm I'm walking around. So I, I, on, on a small screen, I couldn't quite see the 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 detail of the slides. It looks very interesting. Does that change any of the previous hits that we have bought analogs of and might be pursuing, or is it too early to say? Um, 
It's too early to say because at the, at the, the moment the, those pips come from uh, the first plate and I, we haven't completely finished the analysis of, uh, of that yet. So it's a little too early to say. Okay, that's great. Thank you. No more questions, but uh, uh, time scale, Adrian, for finishing off the second half of that. I would imagine that we would have uh, all the coupling enzyme screening done um, by Christmas. Mm -hmm. I would imagine we would have, depending upon how many IC50s we do wind up doing, um, we will probably have that finished, I would imagine, by first, second week of January. Mm -hmm. And uh, Anita, who's not well today and not on the call, uh, has been investigating uh, uh, setting up those assays on a, a robotic system that we have in the department elsewhere. And I think the plan would be to set up the Muir D E. coli assay to screen against all of the compounds uh, as soon as we get back in January. I think that's that's the plan if we have the reagents in hand. Well, we should do. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and certainly if if the robotic side of it works out, then it also makes rolling out the enemy library to the other ligases um, far less of a daunting prospect, perhaps. Mm. Yes. So um, so I think we're going to be able to cut down the experimental time quite significantly using using that, which means rather than just having to cherry pick hits and move them from one ligase to another, we can at least for a few of them re repeat the whole library. Uh, so. I think I, the, the manual method we used to do it, we basically did it in, well, it was three people doing it, but it took us around about, what, three, four days in total. And the actual, in actual fact, although you'd think a stopped assay makes things easier, and in some ways it does, it still took us something like another three or four days to actually get to the stage where we knew or had some idea of what was what in terms of inhibition. Simply through the numbers. Just a, a quick question. Um, when when you say complete the the screen, do you mean of the the, the six hundred member enamine library? So, uh, at the moment, what is incomplete is the uh, coupling enzyme triage that we do to ensure that what we're looking at is specific for MERD. So although that is complete for BO2, it's not complete for BO1, the, the, the other enemy plate. So that still has to be done. Um, and then depending upon what your definition of completion is, and mine would be IC50s and ideally some idea of what is being targeted in terms of a site, then essentially I would like to think we're done when we get to the stage where we know or have a collection of compounds which are genuinely ATP competitive. Okay, that, that's fantastic. Um, and th there was one more question. Apologies if you covered this already. Previously, you were talking about compounds that appeared to be um, interfering with the assay. I'm assuming yeah. that, yeah, that you, have, you, have you gotten rid of those compounds or, or, or is that still an issue with the assay? No, I mean, we, we, we know what they are. Um, so uh, certainly with the, the enamine library, I mean, the enamine library is interesting because the number of non-specific hits we're getting does vary depending on which plate you look at, look at. And that probably is also a function of the way the plate's constructed, which Joe will probably know more about than I do. But, but the thing is that, that um, we, we even, even though we do have some things which do um, inhibit non-specifically, um, we are probably getting anything up to about 19 compounds out of 300 that are of interest that give greater than 50% inhibition. And if the coupling enzyme assays work out in the way I think they will do, they will also turn out to be uh, MERDI Mer specific molecules, although I have to do the experiment first, um, if that answers the question. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I guess the, yeah, the, the question is whether there are plenty of compounds which are inhibiting which are not interfering with the assay and, and therefore it, you know interference by a few compounds isn't really a big deal 
I think you're going to get enough material to work with. Basically, yeah, it sounds like I it. think you are amazing. Yeah. You're on mute, Chris. Thanks, Adrian. I think it'll be more a question of uh, how how we rationally try to prioritize which which series to work with. So I think I think you know at, at, at early in the new year we need to sit down with all of the data with all the chemotypes and all the different you know hit series or or singletons or whatever once we've got all that together and just have a rational a long a long hard look at it. Yeah, uh, that'll be the key thing as to what to progress next. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, Ed has already um, ordered a, a few variants of some of those chemotypes. But but yes, I mean, we'll um, that that won't be all of them. Um, mm. So we will have a little bit of information on some of them, but but absolutely not all of them. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that's worth saying is that those hits that we get, it's they are fragments, but they are discriminatory in that they the, one, the ones we can certainly identify are genuinely MERD specific and don't touch things like PMPs, antinox days, and HRP. And I do wonder um, if there's any way of actually mining that fat structurally. Um, to, it's, it's rather like trying to work out why things don't work as opposed to why they do. Um, is as to why there's anything special about the compounds that basically allows them to discriminate between uh, the four enzymes involved, you know, in other words, that MERDI, the xanthine oxidase, the PMP, and the HRP. Well, certainly it would be interesting to see if they have any um, any particular bit, uh, you know, um, I don't know, risky bit in, in the structure which might account for the interference. Yeah, I mean, if they yeah. share a chemotype, yeah, yeah. Um, inspect by eye. Yeah. Um, so what we will do is, uh, are, are take, taking taking these 19 or so hits and then whizzing them through uh, other ligase assays as well so uh you know c c and pseudomonas c and e and e coli c d and e you know while we're waiting for the whole the whole enamine library to uh, be run again on on muir d just to see which of these are far, fairly mere ligase promiscuous? Um, I guess we're wanting to get to a point where we can identify, you know, a, a good number of those, and uh, and then even even early on, if we've got, you know, if we're getting, you know, fifty plus percent inhibition of several mere ligases, you know, the immediate gut feeling is that they will, if they get into the cells, would show some activity in cells. Even even at this stage, yeah. Um, one last thing: we need to revisit life arc and also the competition compounds as well, uh, which we haven't had the time to do yet. But we basically need to sort out another assay for those. Um, they are they have been left behind slightly, and they need to be done. But I need to look into that. Yeah, I mean, they've been left behind because of their activity against the coupling acid enzymes, haven't they? I know. So we basically need to redesign something else to do the job. Yeah. Yeah. But let's just going back. Uh, uh, I can't remember who I. Oh, yeah. It was David Schley, uh, uh, Joe, and I was talking to him last week, where he's also done Muir enzymes. And uh, I think all of, all of their efforts ended up with a lot of toxic compounds uh, from his experience. Yeah. But, I mean, it comes down to the question, doesn't it? They might be toxic now, but they are fragments. Yeah, 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 and uh, yeah, and and GSK have just spent 20, 30 years re-engineering their latest UTI uh, compound. Just yeah. spent all that time trying to get the toxicity out of it. So, um, yeah, yeah, it is it is doable retrospectively, but I prefer not to. Yeah. But um, anyway, those two you've got that couple you've got um seem to be nice and clean at least in the enzymes we've got so yeah i mean and we've, we've got seven that sail through the most stringent tests we've done and also we've got a further uh, we've got a total of 19 uh the residue, residue of which in other words 12 uh probably needs another coupling enzyme and uh, another uh mer ligase assay just to ensure that they are um working in the way i think they are um mm. and um like I say, we should have 
enough mm. compounds to make deductions from. Mm -hmm. And and as soon as Laura's got her crystals back up and running again, uh, we get those, as many of those that are amenable to going in. Uh, hopefully, structures. Uh, yeah. Soon. Yeah. I'm going to set up Apo and um, UMI, the monopeptide crystals. I'm going to set up at least 10 plates of each <laughs> mm -hmm. so we can do um, a lot of soaking. Uh, and you've got enough protein for that, or are you going to have to make more, or do you need help with I've more? I've got, I need protein already before leaving. Um, so the protein should be okay. I just don't know how much monopeptide is left, but mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I think Julie's just made a whole load more or um, before she went That's away. Okay. Um, okay, good. So good to have some progress, good to get some output. Um, I, I guess in a way we're kind of, I'm kind of biting my fingers, waiting to get the, getting to the stage of, of getting some more structures and then uh, overly ambitiously trying to get them into some bugs. Good. Anyone, any questions, queries, concerns? The, uh, those, the fragments are, sorry, they, you see, you got me, you got me doing it now. They're not really fragments. I don't think those are, aren't they molecular weight, like plus 300, just in the terminology of it, they're, they're sort of elaborated mm -hmm. fragments, right? And just mm -hmm. the fragment to me means pretty, pretty small, like a couple of rings with some of these, uh, enamine compounds and astromite compounds are quite, they're quite big. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. <clears throat> so yeah okay so we'll keep pressing on along, along those lines um we ought to start thinking about where we want to go to for money to press on further <clears throat> and 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 dr drawing up a, a series of criteria as to as to wh where we need to think we need to get to and if that's if that is uh, antimicrobial activity, that's 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 definitely one thing. So we'll probably need to have a, a kind of a, a kind of a sense check as to how much fuel we have in the tank to keep the chemistry going. Um, we're, we're fortunate at Warwick; we've got that lump of money um, to keep Adrian and uh, uh, Anita and Julie going for a while, and Laura. Um, but they've got other things to do as well in life rather than just this. And uh, it'd be nice to get some, you know, funding to get some dedicated staff on this so they can go off and have another life in another world of science as well as mere lie gazers. Um, so um, it'd be good to to think through what we'd like, where we'd like to get to. Joe, do you have any thoughts about uh, NIH and, and what you'd like to get to on the US side? I think you need to talk to Lori. Okay. Okay. Um, there, there was the CC Carb funding, right? Which is is a is a well nominally a U.S. based thing. If 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 you get to something which has some SAR, seems mm -hmm. like it might be promising as an interim. But but certainly from our perspective, yeah, we uh, uh, Yu Hang's doing a PhD and Yi Wei is doing an uh, an MRES and. Um, but besides that, you know, we're going to, our, our, our um, Antibiotics Research UK grant ends in January. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, we're, we're going to need something. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so practically, uh, you know, if we, even if we wrote something in uh, and submitted it in, you know, you know, well, we can't, I don't think we could submit anything in January because I, I don't think we have enough data necessarily unless there's some super super early option to go for um you know we we, we probably need to, to find uh, enough money for the next six to nine months maybe even a bit longer perhaps unless we can get some to get a big grant you know we'll we'll need definitely that length of money I mean. uh, so we're gonna have to find some more interim money for chemistry um I, you, 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 I'll, I'll have a chat to Laurie as well, Joe, just to see what her thoughts are on on that side of things. But Matt, on on your side, what you know, you know, to get through another, you know, you know, half 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 dozen or so, or a dozen or so, 
additional bits of chemistry? What what's what's that going to take? Yeah, the, there is a there is a UCL scheme called the Therapeutic Acceleration Scheme, which comes out twice a year. Uh, and there's a round in January, but I think it's focused on rare diseases, if memory serves. But that that is, that is something which can be used as a kind of bridging scheme if you have something promising and need it progress slightly. Um, mm -hmm. I, I could look into that. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, I mean, I think that if some of these molecules um, are hitting, uh, and if some mm -hmm. of them are uh, it can be explored with commercial sources. So if, if we can develop some SAR by catalog, you know, by ordering a bunch of eating bean compounds, then it, it is in a sense a little simpler because for you know sort of a hundred pounds a shot, you can get another data point, and you don't need mm -hmm. to pay someone to do it. But you are mm -hmm. then. Um, and you, so you can generate that quite quickly, but you are then limited in in what you can order because as soon as you come off the catalog, then it gets expensive. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, in in the short term, to bolster SAR, it, it it could be that we just request some money for for sort of uh, commercial synthesis in in the interim, but that that will only take us so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we do need to get our heads around it um, soon. So I. I don't really know, Joe, what you meant by you have to talk to Lori. What, what does that mean for U.S. funding? Well, I mean, I I I have no standing basically. So, um, it, you know, if you're going to get funding, um, I mean, Lori is associated directly with Northeastern, so I have no standing. So it's really, I mean. Lori, you know, if you're going to try to go after any U.S. funding, whether, you know, it's you, Lori and you, Bart, I mean, who needs to, to do, you know, any kind of grant writing and, and, and solicitation of funds. I mean, I, I'm, I'm here to assist like I have been for the last four plus years, but I don't, I'm not, you know, as you talked about before, you know, like with the paper and everything else, I mean, basically, you know, someone who has standing, I guess, you know, associated with the university needs to take the lead on that. I can't do that. So that's what I was saying. You need to talk to Lori, not me. Okay. But we previously talked about the R21 idea, right? So so I think that there are options, but um, yeah, it just depends again, on what... Again, I think, yeah. yeah. So I, again, you guys, you know, you're you're getting down to the point now where you need to figure out what you're going to do between the US and UK and EU. And like I said, you need Chris and Matt and Laura, you guys need to work through that. I can't, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I, I, I can't do anything with, with that for you guys. You know, if you want help somewhere along the way, I'm, I'm willing to help. But I mean, those kind of decisions and how you're gonna move forward in that aspect of grants, uh, and papers and so on. You need to kind of figure that out and he's going to take the lead and how are you going to approach it? Right, I, I agree. And so I think that that's what we're trying to do is is figure out the landscape. Um, my my opinion on NIH funding is, you know, you, that we should, we should have an application. There's a cycle every four months and we should probably start, probably should have, in the past already started having applications in every cycle as R21s. Um, to do, you don't have to have a publication, I think, to get an R21, but it sure helps. Um, and you're not gonna get an R01 like this. And I don't think we're gonna get CARB funding um, and either until you have a lead molecule. But, no, uh, not, not, not CARB-X, it, it's, it's a single yeah. CC CARB where you can get some chemistry done. So, um, but I do, so the next round is February 4th. And the, and also the problem is, you know, it takes nine months to get any funding. So the next application deadline is February. And so it's not short-term, it's a mid to long-term, but it's gotta, we have to start submitting applications. So um, an application that would originate for me, and I, I have got R21s and I have an R01 on a different topic, so it can sponsor from here, but it would need to be something focused on what we've done here and you know the work the structures that Jan and the other SSGCID groups did. So um, I'm happy to start brainstorming that and 
and figure out how it's not a ton of money, right? It's one, one, the two years, $275 over two years. Um, So, sorry, SSGCID was going to receive money from the NIH? Well, so SSGCID isn't a, a, a body that can request grants, or it's just, just a, it is a contract by NIH. But I work for Seattle Children's Research Institute, and I write grants for Seattle Children's Research Institute. Um, so we can request funds for you to do more work. Well, I would say we should write a collaborative grant that includes money for chemistry. And then on mm -hmm. our side, we would do more. Um, technically, a lot of this work would, as begins to become out of scope for SSGCID, like if we we're doing a lot of assays or comp or, or other biophysical experiments. So we'd want to, the money that would go to Seattle Children's would have to not, would be some stuff that would be uh, in addition to SSGCID. And then SSGCID would write a letter of support for the collaboration. And then you have a sub award that would go to um, one of the, you know, the other labs or both the labs. There's just, it's a small pot of money. So we'd want to make it, um, we use it wisely. And it could also include Joe a uh, as a consultant and put Joe mm -hmm. as a uh, uh, forget the name, but a primary. Um, yeah, that's that's not necessary. But I mean, I think the the, well, the I think challenge it, it would you help have, the, the application. The, yeah, I, I understand. I've I've been on multiple NIH grants with at Northeastern. We have like three grants I'm associated with. Um, the, the challenge you've got you got to work through is as as if you're going to do an R21, which is probably you know is the only route in terms of NIH funding at this point, given the data you have in hand. You know, is the chemistry chemistry is not cheap. You know, <laughs> biology is even more expensive, but chemistry is not cheap. So, you know, a, a, a postdoc, you know, getting a postdoc, for example, at, at Northeastern, you're talking about at least like probably with overhead and everything, it's like. Seventy or eighty thousand dollars a year. So when you have, I think it's a two hundred seventy-five thousand dollar budget, right? So just that's where you guys have to work out, you know, uh, in terms of um, budgets. You know, it's a very small budget, um, and you know how you want to how you're going to work through that in terms of the NIHR twenty one. So that's at least in the U.S. That's the one grant you can probably get at this point. Um, mm -hmm. Even with the data you have in hand, I think you can probably make an argument for an R21 if you want to do chemistry. But that's probably like one post, that's kind of one postdoc, and then may, maybe you get a grad student or something at, in, in Lori and Mike Plastery's lab. That would be kind of the thing. Or, you know, maybe, you know, Matt, you can talk about, you know, what's your chemistry, you know, what kind of, what the options would be if you want to do the chemistry, you know, at UCL. Um, and again, I guess the question there becomes, you know, just in terms of how NIH looks at that, you know, do they want to fund, you know, an R21 with chemistry and, and at UCL? I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the odds are, or what what the issues are, if any. There might not be any issue um, to to do that. But that's where you guys have to work. You know, talk with Lori, and you guys get your heads together and decide, you know, how you want to. Um, if you're, you know, going after an R21 at this point, you know, how you want to do that. That's that's one option. And then the rest of it, I guess you got to figure out what's the UK, EU options for funding. Right. Yeah, I think and they're so, very... <laughs> Carry on, Bob. I was going to say, for the R21s and for this idea, I, it's a similar structure um, as this would probably need to be structured. I have got an R21 where basically two thirds of the money goes to the chemistry lab to do the chemist stuff. And that, that was with the University of Washington. And then recently we submitted another one that had a uh, international collaboration in Sweden. And that was about, I would say maybe, maybe 50% of the money actually went to Sweden as a foreign you know entity, like in a similar arrangement like this. And 
we didn't get funded, but that that was never a criticism. Uh, that structure was never the wasn't the, the criticism of it. So it seems possible to me. I'm just wondering with the chemistry and that's a question to the chemists. You know, how much more cost effective is it just to contract synthesis synthesize compounds? You know, rather than going for all the university overhead of a PDRA, where they just say all of that money goes to Wushi or someone to make up. 10 compounds or 20 compounds is you know, is that i think it's an it's a very effective bit to do right so i think in any chemistry plan you have you definitely have some of that because there are there are times when that's very efficient um but there are times when it isn't necessarily and of course you know what you hope is that the chemists who are doing the lab work are also intellectually contributing to the project um which you know is certainly helpful um so in, in, a, in a phase that we're in right now it's pretty good um, but but we'll I think we'll run out of runway pretty soon um, if we don't have someone in the lab. Uh, you know I, I'd recommend you know about a third of the chemistry costs go on contract synthesis, but that you definitely keep a person in there. Mm. Yeah, I was just my, trying. My, to... my my experience with with contract synthesis uh, at Wushi Sinjin is that you know the FTE cost is about the same as a postdoc in the U.S. Which again, you're you know you're talking sixty or seventy thousand dollars for an FTE per year, and and then you know then it's a matter of you know working up you know how many you know the challenge you end up with is you know uh, once you have your lead matter you pick out decide what you know what series what 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 hits out of the whichever library life arc you mean atom wise whatever then you've got you know, how many, you've got to develop the chemistry and how many series, you know, you want to work on and so on. So it's just, you, you kind of, go, you know, well, obviously you have to have a lot more discussion and kind of see what, you know, chemical equity you have. And then, you know, what's the, but it, my, like I said, my experience typically with CROs is you're talking most, in most cases, you're talking minimum of thousand dollars per compound if you're getting it made someplace else. I mean, that's like an individual compound. Well, obviously, if you start working on a series and you got advanced intermediates, then maybe you know you get you get a few more compounds. But if you're talking like one-off compounds, typically a thousand dollars a compound for getting a, a, at least uh, to get it synthesized at a CRO. I mean, the reason I was suggesting that was it might be a way for the U.S. if, if the U.S. funders didn't really want to pay for a, a British chemist. Um, uh, that you could just you know buy the you know effectively buy, buy you know most of the money goes to just to buy the chemistry and you know, that would just it, it was that that was my thought on that if there was you know. yeah I think in the short term what I would suggest is kind of what Matt brought up earlier which is the CCR uh, I forget the hell the acronym but basically this NIH program that they will provide chemistry to follow up so I think if you can put a package together with some of the hits and ideally. Sorry, Laura, but if you had a crystal structure, then I think you can make a pretty strong proposal maybe to the NIH. This, this uh, chemistry part is doing, you know, it's willing to to make compounds. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that that's definitely something that, that the team should um, pursue, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the near term. Again, if you can get, you know, once once you have some more data nailed down in Adrian's lab. Um, and then you can come up with a chemistry plan. Um, I, I would I would put that kind of thing forward. Hmm. And maybe Matt, Matt, if you want to leave that, I mean, you know, whatever. I, again, that's yeah. just how, how, how I, I'm sorry, I, I, I just don't know how this all works with between, uh, you know, NIH definitely funds. I mean, we have grants right now with between Northeastern and Brazil, Northeastern and South Africa. Northeastern and Spain. Okay. These are all NIH R01 grants. But they're all looked at, you know, as as um, obviously Brazil and South Africa, those are special grants because those are being funded for, you know, developing, partly developing capacity and infrastructure in, you know, other countries. And that's targeted. Um, the one with Spain is more the chemistry is being done in northeastern and the biology there's special biology that's being done in spain you know this can't you know can't be done in northeastern 
So again, it's just th these are things, again, talking with Lori, maybe she'll have a better sense and Matt, I guess your colleagues and how that really works with trying to get, you know, connected with the NIH. I, I just don't know how that, I mean, I, I'm just thinking my, for my, as a taxpayer, I guess, <laughs> I would say, you know, given the UK is very, you know, obviously you guys all the issues you currently have, but the UK and EU, I would think that they would say, well, why aren't you getting grants from either UK or the EU? Um, yeah, yeah, or this no, kind for of work? sure. I, I think, I think that Chris and I have options uh, with the, with the MRC over in the UK, no question. So I think that, 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 that it's not as if there isn't an option there. I think that's fine. I, I will um, look at what's required for the CC4 carb um, thing for chemistry. Um, I'll, I'll find out what the application process involves and get back to everybody about that. But I, uh, that, that could be a good way of, of dealing with things just for 2023. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I have a former AstraZeneca colleague who is involved with that at the NIH, but um, if you need any help with that, Matt, I mean, but I think it's good for you to take the lead, you know, if, you can take the lead or maybe talk with Lori or, or however you guys want to do that um, in terms of pursuing that. But I think that should be a priority for the for the team. OK, great. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the good news is, Joe, that there's, there's some seems to be some real promise coming out of the uh, intermediate screening so far. So and let's hope it continues that way. Uh, it's looking it's looking good. Good, lovely. Um, we're not following the agenda, I'm sorry, Matt. We're just picking up extant stuff. Does someone have something else they'd like to specifically uh, cover? Sorry to land you in the chair, Royal Chris. Um, uh, no, nothing that's from not me right. apart from all the stuff that's on the on the page there. Um, uh, nothing urgent. I, I guess the one thing I wanted to highlight was that uh, Yu Hang's amine, the amino derivative of the AstraZeneca mm -hmm. compound, AZ5595, is the yeah. one that he's sent now, and we were just very excited to see if if the data on that looked good. So it, it bound nicely on SPR. I guess we're just gagging to see if it inhibits uh, Mercy. Yes, uh, I think Laura hasn't got the data yet, but we're we're going to present a comparative analysis of S SPR binding and inhibition slash lack of inhibition as a bit of a, a spoiler alert on SPR. Uh, yeah, I just need the last um, data from the enamine. Yeah, so yeah. We'll, we'll, the enamine data data sets, I think the, the next time we'll be able to present uh, the SPR versus the assays and actually show how important it is to have the assays. And um, yeah, the Johan compounds, we're also going to do the MICs, right? Yeah, yeah. So they will be done before Christmas. Uh, from what if everything goes right i just talked to abby well the other day i talked to abby and uh, she said that she will be able to do it in the next couple of weeks so mm -hmm. yeah you should have a, as well the mic data that's awesome great thank you guys I, that you know that's the compound that we're designing to try to escape efox you know as best we can yeah. um and it, and if it if it inhibits the enzyme then it might be one to try on the on the bacteria to see if we uh, we get any luck yeah just just have a question before we uh finish uh see uh is that is that okay like uh i dissolve my compounds in the mso and uh, ship it like uh this time i mean the concentration was around uh 10 milligrams per mil is that mm -hmm. okay this time like yeah i haven't uh, been able to look into it more closely oh okay yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so because I ship it uh, like a 15 milligrams each compound in 1.5 mil, that's uh, that's a uh, that's that's the concentration I get, and uh, I think store in the MSO is uh, safe. Uh, to yeah. Yeah, I will. Like, we don't mind as long. You know, we have a high uh, concentration for S four crystals, but yeah, I need to look into it. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Cool. Um, any 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 other burning points? I'm sorry, I haven't gone through ticking off all of the to dos, not to dos, but uh, I'm going to have to go at three anyway. Um, yeah, same. Nothing from me. No, great. Uh, if if not, then uh, thank you all for joining. Um, thank you for the data, those who've presented today.
Thank you for your ongoing chemistry, Yuan, and everyone else's support, uh, UK and US. Um, I think we're going to be in a good position come the new year to make some a, a real step forward once we've got all this data assembled. So I think that's, that's looking really encouraging. Um, so good. Uh, nothing else to say, but uh, happy Christmas, everybody. Uh, Matt beat me to it with a chat. Well done. And um, we'll uh, catch up in the new year. That'll be excellent. And uh, any 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 uh, breaking news before then, Yuan, about your compounds, we'll we'll send them to you as an early Christmas present. Awesome. See you, everybody. Thanks. Take care.